seven hours of uh, Zooming that we did yesterday. <laughs> uh, admittedly, three, three of those were uh, playing games with my grandchildren. But in any event, it was a long day. But um, yesterday morning uh, was the Shloshim observance of a friend of ours who obviously passed away a month ago. Um, an Orthodox family. And for the Shloshim, they did something, I think, really, you know, you know, you know was very, was very uh, different, very meaningful and uh, impressive. During the month, they all studied different chapters of the Mishnah. And our friend was a, a, an avid gardener, just loved being in her garden. So what they did is they decided they would each take one of the 39 prohibited, um, you know, categories of work on Shabbat, and uh, especially those pertaining to agriculture, and to demonstrate them and, you know, draw a lesson out of it. And each one, they have six kids, and each one of the kids, the husband and the, uh, the brother, did uh, one aspect of it. Um, and it was just really, you know, they had different seeds, different plants. Um, like one of the sons has a farm up in Vermont. So he was out in one of his fields and uh, he wanted to demonstrate plowing. You know, he said plowing is one, you know, you don't, you shouldn't plow on Shabbat. And he took a rake and he just, you know, raked a, a small piece of earth. And he said, you know, when you rake, or plow, you're pulling up what is growing there. You know, we might call it weeds, but it's stuff that's growing. And it seemed like it may not be constructive. On the other hand, when you do that, you're aerating the soil, you're getting it ready for the, for the uh, giving life to the new seed. And then he um, illustrated that with some instances that, you know, things that he remembered from his childhood with his mother and um, applied that, that to different things. And then each one of the other uh, children did something similar. Um, it was, it's really quite unique. And uh, I, I just, you know, just wanted to share that with anybody. Not that I think anybody should go and have a Shloshim observance next uh, tomorrow, but, uh, but it was very nice. Okay, and with that, we'll get back to uh, where we left off on the different aspects of conservative Judaism and, and, and how uh, we look at um, the various bases of halacha and how, and how we uh, you know, attribute them. First of all, any questions before we go on or um, maybe whoever's the host can mute uh, whoever's making the other noise. I think it's I think it's Arlene that's, that I can hear. Uh, I'm okay. sorry. It looks like we got it. All right. In any event, um, just uh, to review quickly. Uh, where is conservative one? Conservative one was is the view that's probably uh, most people would say is the most strict. Um, in in some ways, we would say it's the most excuse me most traditional. But it's the viewpoint that says, uh, you know, God dictated His will at Sinai and. Uh, any change has to really be um, really thoroughly thought out and uh, and really you know taken you know, not taken very lightly and with uh, much deliberation. Uh, okay, I, it says thus for conservative God, conservative one. God spoke a message at Sinai and belief in the divine authority of that message is the essence of Jewish faith. 
such faith does not preclude an objective historical and literary analysis of biblical text. However, because it was human beings, the prophets, who wrote down their understanding of God's words in their own language and conceptual form. Okay? Now, conservative two. Humans, human beings wrote the Torah at various times and places. Hence, the diverse documents, laws, and ideas in the Torah. These people were, however, divinely inspired, and therefore their words carry the insight of and authority of God. Jewish laws and ideas may be changed for two reasons. First, since the Torah is a combination of divine inspiration and human articulation, we must distinguish the divine and human elements in the tradition and change the latter when circumstances require it. Second, divine inspiration did not happen once and for all at Sinai. The Torah is the document on which Judaism is based and therefore has special importance for us. But divine inspiration continues on in the form of new interpretations of the Torah in each generation and not new revelations. When changes are made, they must be made by the community in two ways described in section, well, and later on, um, through rabbinic decision and communal custom. Only in that way can there be both tradition and change. Uh, let me uh, take a moment to go through each one of these po points. Um, first, it, it recognizes that human beings had a hand in writing the Torah, and it was not done, somebody just didn't sit down at one time in one place and, and, and compose it, but it was done at various times and places. Um, and these people were divinely inspired. Notice that divinely inspired in this uh, text is in italics. Um, and uh, really that's the crux of a lot of debate of exactly what does it mean to be divinely inspired, and we'll get to that in a couple of minutes. Okay, uh, any, any questions yet? Yes. This reminds me of <clears throat> everything in the Bible is true. How do we know? Because the Bible says so. Um, the, the distinguishing between, and you're going to go through divine inspiration, you said, which I hope is enlightening, but uh, it seems to me that when, when human beings want to change something, they simply decide that it is therefore, because, because it's, it's, it needs to be changed, it therefore is not divinely inspired. Um, it, it just seems so circular to me. What, what am I missing here? That, that the idea to change can be divinely inspired. The idea to change. So the idea to change something that was originally divinely inspired, so God can change his mind. Is that what you're saying? Um, yeah. Okay. Well, no, I, I, I'm not sure I want to say God can change his mind. But I think, I think that what we want to say here is that, um, first of all, we st we're starting off with the basic premise that halacha in and in of itself is um, evolutionary in the sense that halacha can change through the years. And... And um, if circumstances in our lives change, or circumstances in the uh, welfare of the world, shall we say, uh, change, then we have, uh, we can and should look at halacha and decide if there is justification for us to modify what we consider to be a halakhic stance. Now, um, I, I guess, you know, what your question is, is really saying 
is what do we really mean by divinely inspired, right? Okay. Um, you know, if I'm a firm believer that if we are created in the image of God, then there's, then there's an element of godliness within each one of us. And therefore, if we come up with something and we have an idea and we do something with it, then I think that there's, that's divinely inspired. When you write, what you write has an element of divine in it, even though you may not think so. Right? And others may not think so. But um, so, so then what's the distinction between divine, divine, divine inspiration and, I mean, so you're saying everything is divinely inspired to I some think. extent. It's in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> right, but the... But they, you know, ultimately what this position in conservative two comes down to, though, um, they look at halacha and, and apply the first test that they apply is saying, is this rationale or is this application of the halacha? Does that come directly from, from our written text in the Torah? Or is it something that the later rabbis came up with? You know, it says mida mida oraita or mida mida rabbanan. You know, from from the law, you know, from from God, oraita is God, or from uh, you know human beings. Um, and it, and there are certain uh, elements of halacha that we can easily detect that the way we apply the written text is a direct you know, interpretation of the text. Most other of it is really, you know, um, applications of different interpretations that have happened through the years. Okay? So what we mainly look to change is those interpretations. Um, anytime that you see um, a response from dealing with any type of any type of question, the first thing that they have to do is go and find what text does the original halacha come from, and is there any text that can support the position that we want to come to? So, so what about all those laws in Leviticus um, that, that we no longer subscribe to? Um, I mean, didn't it say somewhere that <clears throat> If a man shaves his beard, we can stone him. Uh, what happened to that? Is that what it's? I don't remember that one, but uh, I, I never think I saw that somewhere. I, I never paid attention to that one. I don't, well, no, I mean, you know, the whole the whole idea is what happened to all the sacrifices. But I think that's a perfect example of how we can say we have a text and we found that there were where was reasons for us not to follow precisely what the text says. You know, we don't have a temple. Uh, we don't have sacrifices. You know, we have come up with substitutes for sacrifices. Maury, can I, can I jump in here for a sec? Sure. So I, I'd like to back up a little bit uh, in response to, to Art's question and address something that's maybe a little bit more fundamental. Um, one way to express my concern is um, traditionally, do we view God as, as a noun or a verb? Um, and another way of putting that is, do we believe that, that creation is static or is it a process? Okay, let's put it to a vote. How many think it's static? How many think it's a process? Okay. I, I think the question, the question needs to be defined though. I mean, do we, uh, do, do, is, are you asking whether 
Jews traditionally believe that or whether we personally believe that? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Uh, if I think they're different answers. What do you mean? What do you mean by static, Doug? Well, I mean, I've I've done some reading in connection with some other things on on the Jewish view of time, and time in in Judaism. There are there are there are writers who say that time is not viewed as linear, but rather as helical, as something that wraps back around on itself in some sense, but also simultaneously evolves. So you can never come back to the same point, even though you're celebrating the same rituals. Um, if that notion applies to, to um, Jewish observance more broadly than just in terms of the calendar, then it's a strong argument for suggesting that holding all practice to something at a point of time is illegitimate. What do you say, illegitimate or legitimate? Illegitimate. Oh. Well, every every one of in your example of practice, I mean, every Pesach, everybody's seder has something slightly different about it than the one before. It might be, you say, everything exactly the same way, but reactions may be different. People who are there may not be there. People who had not been there are now there. So all those things have some, in your words, I guess, evolutionary impact on the practice. You, you, you can't go back and have exactly the same Seder in all respects as you had in any other year, but but and, I don't know. And, and in fact, sure that's creation. I don't know that that's part of creation. I think so. I mean, maybe creation was an evolution to a point, and then evolution continues once there was something in place. Um, depending on what you believe creation was, but um, oh. <clears throat> go ahead. If we're supposed to be partners with God in tikkun olam, then the world cannot be static. There has to be room for change and evolution, development, whatever you want to call it, uh, or else there you can't say, I mean, there is no room for tikkun olam if, if everything is static and finished. Very good more, point. More, can I ask a question? The, the notion in A and B, when it says the, the people, everything was written down by humans and these people were divinely inspired. Um, how is it, where's the logic behind saying well, if we can find some textual support in the Torah for this, then that can support changes that we want to make later on. If everything that was done to begin with was done by humans and divinely inspired, what are we, what are we building the foundation on but for interpretation? That's its interpretation from the get-go. Well, you know, let's let's draw an analogy with the with American law, right? What's the basis of all of everything in American law? The Constitution. Constitution, right? Um, you know, uh, as we know, as every time we go down to Independence Mall, we know that there were a bunch of guys who uh, got together and, you know, and, and wrote this constitution. And then we established a rule of law that says everything that happens legally, uh, you know, in this country has to be in accord with the constitution. 
okay? Now, there are, there are times when we found that the Constitution was lacking or something that ha had happened that we felt there needed to be changes and we've added, you know, how many amendments are we up to now? Was it 20 something? 27. 20 something. something. Yeah. Like that. Whatever, <laughs> you know, and so we've been able to amend it. And I think that if you look at this halakhic process, we have a similar type of thing. In other words, that we take the Torah as the comparable to a constitution, um, and it doesn't cover everything, and some things in it are conflicting, um, and to which the rabbis were always saying, well, it doesn't, that, that law over there doesn't really count in this situation. The one over there count, counts for that situation. Uh, you know, there are ways of interpreting it to make it apply. Um, and I think that this, this part of conservative two takes a position that we, we view the written law in the same way that, that we view the Constitution. Anything that we're going to do has to be in accord and, and, and come from this written law. Um, when there are conflicts, then we have to figure out ways to, uh, to, make it, uh, to make it work, or if we wanted to come up with a, a, a new way of doing things, then we need to find a, a basis to, uh, to, to, you know, to put our thoughts. I mean, for example, the, the um, you know, doing services by Zoom on Shabbat. Um, we looked at the, we looked at what is, uh, what are the different, you know, halachic uh, rulings that say people may have avoided it, and some people still do, uh, and where are other halachic concerns which may either change or override the first ones. Um, and I, I think, you know, we'd have to get into the, uh, you know, into the teshuva and go over, you know, when we go over that is to see which ones they pick. But I think the process uh, was one of looking and saying, what, what's really happening here? Uh, what do we need to look at? What do we need concern with? What's our modern issues that we need to be, that we are concerned with? And you know, do we have to live with it um, in the land of prohibitions? Or can we look and say, well, there's a principle that can override previous principles? Or uh, could we go and read through conservative three and then come back to this so we see what the uh, alternative is, I mean, we've read through the orthodox alternative and conservative one alternative. Uh, maybe if we had all those alternatives all laid out, it would be clear. Maybe not. <laughs> uh, or maybe make it worse. Yeah, well, that's always possible. All right. Um, I put up on the screen, um, well, first of all, there's the summary paragraph of two, putting the decision in the hands of rabbis in each generation does not guarantee wisdom or divinity, but is the best we can do. Life does not come with guarantees, besides the tradition requires that we proceed in the way. Okay, conservative three. I don't Revelation is a disclosure of God himself, not the declaration of specific um, rules or ideas. We don't we have that on the screen we more. We can't see that on the screen. Oh, you don't have it. Uh, what am I sharing here then? We've You're still got it. two. Now you have nothing, right? Right. <laughs> well, we've got lots of people. Ah, here we go. Here we go. All right. As I was saying, 
Revelation is the disclosure of God himself. It is not the declaration of specific rules or ideas, but rather a meeting between God and man in which they get to know each other. This meeting is asserted for different reasons and described in different ways by the existentialists and objective thinkers of this group. In other words, there are variant understandings of the act of revelation. I think that addresses what was asking, am I right? Doug, nod your head. All right. Both schools agree, however, on the nature of the text of revelation. The Torah is a record of how human beings responded to God when they came in contact with him or her. Jewish law has authority for the Jew, both because it represents the attempt of the Jewish people to spell out God's will as revealed in the ongoing encounter with him, and also because Jews are members of a covenantal community and have obligations under that covenant to God and to the Jewish community of the past, present, and future. The divine and communal aspects of Jewish law make it a series of mitzvot and not just minhagim. In contradistinction to the position of conservative four below, conservative three, four conservative three, oh wait a minute, I missed the period there. Um, the divine and communal aspects of Jewish law make it a series of mitzvot, not just minhagim, in contradistinction to position of conservative four. Conservative four uh, is now what we would call con reconstructionism or reconstructing, we, we got to call it reconstructing Judaism, right? For conservative three, both God and the Jewish community command a Jew to act in accordance with Jewish law as it, had interpreted, as it is interpreted in each generation. And the Jew renews his own personal contact with both, with both and so acting. However, since the Torah was written by human beings, if we want to learn about the origins and meanings of the Bible, we must use the techniques of biblical scholarship as thoroughly and honestly as we can. Moreover, because the Bible is the human recording of the encounter between man and God during times past, the specific ideas and laws contained therein reflect the practices, values, and attitudes of those times. They may lo no longer be an adequate expression of our own understanding of what God demands of us now. We in our day have not only applied the right, but responsibility. We have not only the right, but the responsibility to make appropriate changes in the tradition that has come down to us so that it will reflect God's will as accurately as possible and accomplish it as effectively as possible in the contemporary world. I think, frankly, I think that addresses Art's question about uh, the divine inspiration of what came before. At least you know, those who hold to this position uh, <coughs> it that way. Uh, and finally, while every person may have his own relationship with God, it is God's encounter with the Jewish people as a whole that is primary importance. The communal character of Revelation is, in fact, the distinguishing feature of Judaism. Consequently, changes in the laws of Judaism must be made by the rabbis on behalf of the community, as the tradition requires, and not by individuals on their own. But the entire body of Jewish law, as interpreted by the rabbis of our times, is binding on every Jew as a member of the community, covenanted with God in the generation of Jews, past, present, and future. Mm. There's a lot in that one. Okay. Um, so it's, there... it's more like your constitution um, argument. For example, you know, you, 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 have a, you have a process with the Constitution that allows for amendments, but the amendment process is one that requires essentially because of communal, the numbers, yeah. Of communal, yeah, communal consent. It's not just one state decides or one party decides this is what it's going to be. Um, yeah. I think 
this is it. Yeah. No, no, no. Um, more does, does, I don't recall, but does the conservative two co comparing to this, does that state that the, um, the, the, the interactions between God, for example, this revelation of God's own disclosure, which we see here, is not accepted in the same way in I get it, get out of here. Um, let me go back. Because I under the way I understood conservative too was that the people were inspired by God's actions as we read about them, but it's not. It's not an acceptance of that revelation the way it seems to be in Conservative Three. No, I, I, I actually I think I look at it the other way, is that in two, um, it puts more weight on the acceptance of the revelation, and it says because we accepted that revelation, then. That's a sacrosanct area. Okay. Three, it, three it gets a little bit looser and says, well, yes, people encountered God, you know, previously and came up with a Torah that came out of that encounter. Right. And, and but because it was, it was an encounter, not necessarily a complete revelation. Uh, well, you know, or even it starts off by saying revelation is the disclosure of God himself. It's not the revelation of the of specific rules or ideas. So that that gives the ability to make those change make changes easier than by saying, all right, God gave us these rules. And then as art says, how can we say God gave it to us, but now we can come along and change it? I think Okay. And that's the way of, uh, I, see, I see that as an answer to, to Art's question, if you will, um, it, you know, and, and it differentiates it from, from two. And what I think that um, Elliot, Elliot, it's Elliot Dorff who wrote this, I, th I think what he's saying here with all, with all one, two, and three, and four in a way, um, that we have all these aspects within conservative Judaism, uh, and ultimately, I, I think he would say it becomes, uh, it, it falls back to the congregation as to which one they want to choose, um, because they're all accepted uh, positions, you know, the unity and diversity. But more, do you, do you really think that the congregations make that decision or the respective rabbis? Well, I think, you know, if you want to say in practicality, yes, it's, it's, the, it's the leadership that the rabbi provides, but if the congregation doesn't go along with it, he doesn't have a job. <laughs> so, so yes, I, th I think, and most rabbis would be, I think most rabbis today are very quick to add that they take their positions in consultation with their ritual committees and, and, their, um, and their boards so that they know that when they um, take, a, they take a position on something or the other, if they don't have agreement you know, within the community, it's not going any place. I know that when with the rabbi, when we were doing the rabbi search, we asked each of the candidates um, how they would propose to exercise their authority as Mara de Atra. I think that's the way we asked the question, although I'm sure that um, Art will correct me. Um, and it was it, there was a variation, but they but as you say, they all talk about talked about consultation. 
yeah, and I think, you know, and, um, you know, how many times have we heard of uh, rabbis will go and make uh, certain changes, which happen to uh, up upset a, a, a significant um, portion of, of the congregation. The next thing we know, um, there's another minion starting two blocks away, and those people are going over there. And well, I, re I mean, I remember hearing, I wasn't active at BZBI at the time, but when the conservative movement took their first position, I think, with respect to LBGTQ um, issues, um, Rabbi, be before marriage was legal under, Amer under the decision of the Supreme Court, I think that Rabbi Stone announced that he was prepared um, to marry gay couples, <laughs> and there were congregants who walked out. I, I remember the same thing. Um, and even before that, um, there, when we started the discussion of the Imaot, um, that um, some people just, not just, in, wait a minute, it wasn't the Imaot, it was, and there was, it was a woman's issue. And um, I remember having a conversation while walking home one Shabbat morning with one of the guys and uh, upset that, that this was even being, whatever issue it was, was being considered. And he said, the next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna tell me that God didn't give the Torah at Sinai. And I said to him, what's wrong with that? <laughs> and the next thing I know he had, uh, switched over to Makor HaBracha, but, but in, uh, in any event, um, yeah, I mean, there are certain things that come up and people get upset and uh, uh, it's who agrees with the change and who doesn't. And, and sometimes uh, we find that there are, uh, you know, people change their affiliation or, or whatever, you know, and um, I think there's more to be said, and I'm looking at the time, and as I anticipated, this will certainly go on for at least another week, maybe two. Um, and, um, you know, what I, what I can say is to be continued. But I, I just want to know, Art, Art, do you think that this in any way does answer your question? It, it, it is an answer to my question. It is an answer to my question. Whether it is a satisfactory answer, I, I have to think about. But um, fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. Um, I uh, then I think then I think we've accomplished something today. <laughs> more do you when in rabbinical school, whether a JTS or a Ziegler, and I know you know less about Ziegler. Do you is this just Obviously, Dorf is, an act, is a professor at one of those institutions. Do you think he draw he teaches these distinctions, in encouraging rabbis to get, to develop to adopt their own philosophies with respect to this one, two, and three conservative Judaism? Um, I don't know. I, all I can say is that you know, as I pointed out a couple of times, uh, this book was published in the early seventies. Um, so whether he still holds by this, I, I don't know. I, uh, next time I see, well, next time I see him, if I ever see him with, with what's going on, I can certainly ask him that. Or, uh, if I'm brave, I can email him and ask him. Um, but, um, I, I, I don't know, but I, I think, I personally think that, um, there are still, I think within the conservative movement, I'm not sure that we have strong, a strong component of what is called conservative one. I think there are strong two and threes, and fours have moved over to become uh, reconstruction. reconstruction. So I think there are, 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 are elements of definitely of two and three. Um, 
and I see, you know, among some of the conversations going on about decisions of the, uh, the, uh, the, the law committee that um, they, they uh, sometimes will break, will call themselves, well, I'm more of the traditionalist, I'm more of the hard, you know, to, you know, right winger on this committee, which I think is more in tune with two. Mm. And those who are more, are more or, or more liberal are more in with three, or as he describes three. But uh, I think, you know, a, a lot of this, you know, you know, was based on what was going on there. And remember, um, while I, I find this book useful for this discussion, uh, it was a book that was written for, com, uh, cons, um, what do we call it? Um, not consec consecrations when the kids start, you know, uh, what, what do they do when they graduate high school? Confirmation. 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 Yeah, it was written for, uh, for a text for a confirmation class. So I put it that way. But I, I'm not sure where Elliot is personally at this point. Could you send us each one, two of those, the, the written page by email, those three pages? Which three pages? The three pages that are the just the real just maybe all five pages, most the chart and the three descript the these power the page that you have up now. Yeah, I can tell, I'll, I'll send you. I, my thing is because uh, when I scan some of these things, I I made some mistakes. You notice I used two different ones today because I realized that this page here that I have on the screen when it when I scanned it, I cut off the right edge, so I have a whole bunch of different files. Um, but yeah, I can send them to you. Thank that you. would be great. Thank you very much, Mort. Yes. That you, would be you good. Yes. Um, 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 Arlene, in, in kind of an answer, uh, somewhat of an answer to your question about um, the usefulness of it of rabbis who are or people studying to be rabbis. I'm sure everyone has, uh, for most people, there are variations in their thoughts. And it's sometimes helpful to know that you're not the only one who has questions about this or accepts that. And you might, um, you know, depending on where your head is as you're studying, I think it's a, it's a, it's a support. It doesn't mean that you'll find a congregation that will go along with your approach, which is another issue. But at least it, it kind of lays out the field. I, I, I think that's interesting, Sue. I mean, I think when you think about a place like um, Elkins Park, where there were two uh, conservative congregations so close to each other, I think that that's really very much true in the sense that people probably chose between Beth Sholem and AJ on the basis of the building or on the basis of the rabbi. Yes. Um, but, um, but I think, it, I mean, it's always been my perception that most, and maybe that happens in Lower Marion today, but I think most um, conservative Jews pick the, they pick, con I would have thought picked their congregations primarily on the basis of which is closest, no, rather I'm, than which I'm, you know what the rules are. Yeah, but I think that from the 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 rabbis themselves, I agree with you. Uh, but from the the standpoint of someone studying and understanding that he might only or she might only be you know, might be 20% conservative one and 10%, you know, I mean, <laughs> it's yeah. just, it's a healthy thing to know you're not the only one who's kind of out there. And yeah. to understand where you might have to change in, in or, or not, but, but express who you are to, the, to uh, prospective employers, let's say. And, and when I say that people choose locally, I mean, I, I know I had a conversation with Jeff Urock and I'm trying, when he moved to, to the Western suburbs and I'm trying to remember the basis on which he chose the synagogue he joined because there are obviously 
multiple choices out there, all of which he would have had to drive to. Um, and, and, I could, and I could well understand choosing on the basis of the rabbi or the, um, what, what we in law, in law firms call the culture of the organization. Yes. Um, but I always thought that culture meant, meant more about, you know, whether we, what people had reserved seating on the high holidays and how they, <laughs> and, and how ungapats could they were for those holidays. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I think, I think, frankly, vast, vast majority of conservative Jews don't know anything about what we've been talking about. Probably, that's right. More. And, and people join or don't join shuls for a whole bunch of different reasons. Um, the rabbi, the cantor, the choir, the looks of the building, uh, how far cool. away it is, uh, how big their parking lot is. Will they give them a reserved spot if they need it? Uh, whatever, you know. I, I, and I think I hear, a, very often I hear, well, I like this shul because they're very accepting of me where I am, not that I have to fit into their mold. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I've heard people who belong to conservative synagogues, when you ask them, they go, they go I'm a reform, I'm a reform, you know, I'm a reform Jew. So people don't even know it the conservative movement is, I think you're right, or what he really believes in. I know of people who drive, who drive to the conservative show, park their car and walk around the corner to the Orthodox. Well, that's, <laughs> that's very common, right. Thank you, thank you, Stu. I, I, I was waiting for somebody to react to that one. <laughs> well, I was in an Orthodox <laughs> show where people would drive and park four blocks away and walk the rest of the distance. Thank you, Mort, for all of this.